This month, we celebrate the centenary of a festival of nine lessons and carols in King's College Chapel upon Christmas Eve 1918. And at 3 o'clock p.m. on the 24th of December 1918 in that chapel of King's College, Cambridge, an expectant congregation waited with bated breath for the service to begin. Those of you that have been here before know that that's not how it started. <laughs> um, we need to go back to Cornwall in the last quarter of the 19th century. And in 1876, the Archdeaconry of Cornwall became the brand new diocese of Truro. And in the following year, Edward White Benson was consecrated first Bishop of Truro on his way to becoming Archbishop of Canterbury. And in 1880, Bishop Benson instituted a festal service for Christmas Eve, nine lessons with carols. Note the preposition, it's nine lessons and carols now, but originally it had been nine lessons with carols. And at 10 o'clock in the evening, on the 24th of December, 1880, Truro Cathedral fell silent as the service began. Which, again, is not, not how it started. Um, <laughs> it started with the Lord's Prayer. And then were sung the Precies. It should be obvious that what you're witnessing is essentially an enhanced evensong, albeit one that was held at 10 p.m. In 1880, this glorious uh, 16th century parish church of St. Mary's, uh, which had been acting as Truro Cathedral for four years, was almost entirely dismantled to make way for the Gothic revival building, the three-spired cathedral that we know now. And, uh, as you probably know, a little bit of that uh, church was kept and still survives in the cathedral. But if you go to the back of the cathedral, towards the west end, now you will see this column. Forgive my photography. I don't know how to do it without uh, getting that uh, flash in the middle. Um, on a column near the back of the cathedral, you'll uh, find this proud announcement. To the glory of God, this stone was placed by H.R.H. Albert Edward, that's the future King Edward VII, Prince of Wales, and importantly, Duke of Cornwall, on the same day as the northeast cornerstone of this cathedral church, 20th of May, Anno Domini, 1880. And while work got underway on the new structure, as I say, more or less taking most of St. Mary's away, a temporary 400-seater wooden building was erected. And it was in this glorified shed that the innovative festival service for Christmas Eve, Nine Lessons with Carols, was first held. These days, Bishop Benson would, I think, likely be described as a control freak. His son put it rather more lyrically when he said that his father could not stand aside and watch tolerantly another mind working on different lines to himself. <laughs> I think we know what he meant. But it was Bishop Benson's single-mindedness and ambition that was responsible for the creation of the service of nine lessons with carols. So what was the first item that the congregation joined in with? It was, the Lord at first had Adam made. And this opened the second volume of Bramley and Stainer's Christmas Carols, New and Old, of 1871. So that's a relatively new publication at the time. That's just nine years old, this book here. Along with hymns Ancient and Modern of 1861, that's what you can see there, uh, and its appendix of eight years later, these were the church hymnals of the day. 
And this is the carol that the congregation first sang. So as you can hear, uh, see here in uh, Bramley and Stainer, uh, it makes the distinction between semi-chorus and chorus, which I hope you just made clear. In the Truro service, that was choir answered by congregation. It's all about the drama. The thing about this service that Benson set up is it's all about it. Things like that, uh, making the congregation think for themselves, making the congregation respond to a dynamic scheme. They were active contributors, not the sort of singing that you might sometimes witness now uh, in church, even on Christmas Eve, uh, but it's about positively engaging with the drama. Now, on arrival in Cornwall, Bishop Benson developed an interest in Celtic culture, again, as described here by his son, the writer A.C. Benson. My father enjoyed himself to the full, visibly and audibly. He exulted in the poetry, the romance, the old, remote, mysterious traditions of Cornwall. He loved the eager, affectionate people, their pretty talk and ways, their quick religious feeling, their local and personal pride. And what we're talking about here is the West Country tradition of caroling that had all but died out in the towns by the beginning of the 19th century. And this is an important publication uh, to the whole uh, carol uh, revival, but particularly in Cornwall. Some ancient Christmas carols with the tunes to which they were formerly sung in the west of England. And this is by a man called David uh, Davis Gilbert, who was an engineer, but he was also MP uh, in Cornwall. And he writes in his preface, the editor is anxious to preserve these carols on account of the delight they afforded him in his childhood. So he was an engineer, an MP, and a carol collector. Now here's the earlier version of what you've just heard. What you've just heard is our view of how it might have been sung in Truro Cathedral uh, in 1880. Here's our view of what it might have sounded like when Davis Gilbert was collecting it on the streets of Cornwall uh, some decades before. more 
rustic uh, interpretation, uh, not just in terms of how we've sung it, but in its two-part version there, the sort of thing that you can imagine being sung outside uh, on Christmas Eve, outside people's houses. Arthur Benson also described how his father, Bishop Benson, became interested in the nonconformist leanings of the new diocese. Quote, he always recognised, quite frankly, that Methodism had kept religion alive in Cornwall when the church had almost lost the sacred flame, and he treated nonconformity as an enthusiastic friend. Uh, deconstructing that, essentially, Truro's Methodists were having much more fun singing hymns than Benson's Anglicans were. And the 1880 Christmas Eve, Eve service of Nine Lessons with Carols was designed to redress that balance. Carol singing by the church choir in Truro on Christmas Eve had been a well-established custom, although the singing was in the nature of a carol crawl around the larger houses of the church-going parishioners. And in 1878, Benson's second Christmas in Truro, there was a request from some parishioners to mount a proper carol service, as reported in the West Britain and Cornwall Advertiser. The choir of the cathedral will sing a number of carols in the cathedral tomorrow evening, Christmas Eve, the service commencing at 10 o'clock. We understand that this is at the wish of many of the leading parishioners and others. A like service has been instituted in other cathedrals and large towns and has been much appreciated. It is the intention of the choir to no longer continue the custom of singing carols at the residences of the members of the congregation. And I suppose implicit in that is the richer members of the congregation. That's what it had been. And this new move uh, was to get everybody, or as many people as Benson could, into the cathedral. I suppose the, the, the issue he had was one of space in that uh, it, it was a wooden shed and it only held uh, 400 people, but he would do with 400. When it happened, uh, that first uh, experiment, the service packed out and quotes was much enjoyed and perhaps most gratifyingly for the bishop, many non-conformists as well as churchgoers were present. So uh, he, uh, he, he succeeded and the experiment was repeated a year later in 1879. And in the following year, the Nine Lessons with Carols was instituted. Now, the first thing that strikes us today about the 1880 service is the brevity of the biblical readings, the so-called lessons. The shortest is a mere two verses, and the longest, 14. That's the indispensable opening passage of St. John's Gospel, in the beginning was the word. That's the longest by far. Now, it's oft repeated, and I might have even done so myself in the past, that uh, because so many people have mentioned it, that the Truro service was designed to keep people out of the pubs. Um, it's not true. I mean, I have, I, have an in, I have a vested interest in pubs. I spend a lot of time in them. So I, uh, I investigated the licensing acts uh, of the, uh, obviously in situ, the licensing acts of the late 19th century, and closing time on Christmas Eve was 10 p.m. So it strikes me that rather actually trying to keep people out of the pubs, what Bishop Benson was doing, he was trying to kettle the pub goers as they left, <laughs> in, which actually makes much more sense in terms of Benson wanting to fill his cathedral. Why would you have a service at 10 o'clock otherwise? To me, it was a brilliant bit of marketing, and it worked, and it worked. The service lasted for under an hour, so it was over by 11 p.m., and was very loosely modelled on Coral Eden song. So as you've heard, it began with the sung preces, O Lord, open thou our lips, and it involved the chanting of the Magnificat, my soul and spirit filled with joy, so to a metrical psalm version. The responses, the Lord be with you, and the collect, the prayer for Christmas Day, Almighty God, who has given us thy only begotten Son. So essentially, it is an even song. But the mince in the pie of the service was the alternation of carols and readings. Now, the congregation joined in with four carols, Good Christian Men Rejoice, Bethlehem of Noblest Cities, O Come All Ye Faithful, and Once Again, O Blessed Time. And it joined in with the refrains of two others, the first Noel and the Lord at first had Adam made that you've just heard. So here's the first one that they joined in with. And in Good Christian Men Rejoice, where you have the third verse's interjection with the words, peace, peace, this is Mark Piano. 
and this dynamic marking had not appeared in the hymnals, so this was an innovation of that night. It's extremely effective, but the idea of expecting the congregation to be able to sing quietly, to understand what an italic P means in the book for a start, but this was the expectation. Um, Benson, and I've always said this, the higher expect expectations you have of your congregation, the more likely they are to rise to the occasion. And it seemed that Benson's congregation did. So um, here's uh, Good Christian Men, uh, and we'll sing it now. And the choir also <coughs> sang three extracts from Handel's Messiah. <coughs> Now, I noticed you didn't stand up when we sang, <laughs> not when we sang Messiah, uh, not when we sang um, Hallelujah Chorus, I wouldn't expect you to, but I might have expected you to stand here at Glory to God, as you'll see, Benson expected. So it's not just the dynamics and the singing along, it's the fact that actually the congregation's posture, whether it was kneeling or sitting or standing, again, was integral to the drama, and that must have been a great effect. You doubtless know this movement and you have everything leading up to it. And then when the choir belts in with that, the congregation rises. The whole thing was a pretty dramatic hour. Um, o come, all ye faithful, also required to, uh, um, the congregation to respond to a dynamic scheme. Each verse began forte, but the refrain started with a sudden hushed pianissimo at its start. You can see that's literally peppered with dynamics. This isn't for the choir, this is for the congregation. You've got to have your wits about you in this service. Uh, and so this refrain starts with a pianissimo and then grows via a crescendo to its end. Again, you won't find this dynamic scheme in hymns, ancient and modern, until almost a decade later. So the hymn book, in its other editions, copied the Truro service. Um, so, as I say, Benson expected vocal commitment from his congregation and he blazed a dramatic tra trail in terms of committed carol singing. Uh, so here's O Come All You Faithful and here's verse 2. We'll try and as far as we can do the dynamics of Truro. Bishop Benson designed the format of the service and he referenced medieval custom when he chose nine readings to give a narrative structure to the service. It was also Benson's idea to have the lessons read in rank order 
uh, from chorister to bishop. These are his own notes, which I found in the uh, library in Truro. Um, a very moving document, I find. But you can see he went through a number of different ideas. But uh, in contravention to what eventually happened, he... He'd originally intended to start with a chorister on each side, but the important thing about it, doesn't matter who's doing it, the important thing is it starts with a very lowly or young member of the congregation, and crucially, bearing in mind what uh, his son said about him and the way in which I've translated into modern terms, the point is that the last reading is by the bishop. So the point is it's all leading towards his involvement of reading the ninth lesson. He was an ambitious man you don't get to be Archbishop of Canterbury unless you have a certain amount of ambition. <laughs> so Benson's shaping of a service that progressed from Adam's fall in the book of Genesis to the promise of eternal life in the first epistle of John in the New Testament was groundbreaking, but here he is planning it. The carol service therefore replaced an elitist community event with a public cathedral service. That said, they were working in a temporary wooden shed, which cost a meagre £430 to build at the time. But the shed, it was quite some shed, was fitted out with a bishop's seat, a pulpit, a font, oak benches, gas fittings, and the organ salvaged from the old church. In 1884, so four years after the Truro service was launched, Mowbray and Co. published the Nine Lessons with Carol's Order of Service for tuppence, as you can see. Three hymns were designed as substitutions for the Messiah extracts in the absence of a competent choir. So if you couldn't sing the bits of Handel's uh, Messiah, they gave you hymns to sing instead. It was published again in 1911, uh, and the Nine Lessons with Carol's Service still had the same format in 1911. Um, by which time Bishop Benson, who'd left Truro to become Archbishop of Canterbury, had been dead for almost 15 years. So the service grew very rapidly, even after his death. So what was happening at King's Cambridge at the time? Well, the answer was a sort of carol service happened on Christmas Eve. It was evensong, really, but it had a festive introit and a festive anthem. So what was the introit? Yeah, it was, it was actually uh, once in royal, but it wasn't a solo. It was all of the trebles that sang. And here's how M.R. James, the pre-First World War provost of kings, uh, described it. Just before the clock struck five, the boys would issue from their vestry on the north side, the men from the Hackenplain Chantry on the south. Last, the officers came from the Brassy Chantry, and, led by Walter Littlechild with his silver verge, proceeded westwards and took their stand near the south door. A faint musical hum was heard of the choir taking up the note, and then it seemed to give the very spirit of Christmas. The boys broke quite, quite softly into once in Royal David City and began moving eastward. With the second voice, the men joined in. I declare I do not know what has moved me more than this did, and still does, when I recall it. Uh, we'll now sing you uh, the second verse in composer Henry Gauntlet's own harmonization of 1847. Things to note, uh, apart from the fact it may not be all of the harmonization you know, but also this marking allegro moderato, which is definitely not how we do it. Now, I, I just, this once, let's just respect the composer's speed and see how it sounds.
it's a very different effect, but you can see uh, how it might have been uh, what Gauntlet uh, required. Um, that's a wonderful harmonization, as I say, by the composer himself. Henry Gauntlet was a London organist who wrote over a thousand hymn tunes. I think it's delightful that one of them has survived anyway. <laughs> um, here's how it appeared uh, when hymns ancient and modern came out, a very different harmonization. It credits H.J. Gauntlet there, and he was indeed the composer of the tune, but they've changed the harmonies really quite significantly. I find it, compared to Gauntlet's own harmonization, I find it a little bit staid. Um, and uh, also, you don't get that feeling of, uh, at the start of the second verse, of things coming down from heaven, as you do uh, in Gauntlet's own version. So this version in ancient and modern has already come down to earth by the time the second verse starts. But, to be fair, hymns, ancient and modern, wasn't designed for the choir of King's College, Cambridge. It was writing for normal congregations, and in that sense, it, it does an, an excellent harmonisation. Now, the choir master at King's Cambridge was Arthur Mann, who was known universally as Daddy. His mission was to improve standards of singing within King's Chapel. Uh, improvement in standards of choral singing in England was very much in the air at the time. Now, there were two anthems that were usually used in alternation at the King's Christmas Eve Evensong pre-First World War. One was by the 17th century organist of Salisbury Cathedral, Michael Wise, and is practically unknown today. But yet, this is one of the ones that they used to sing at Evensong on Christmas Eve. seem to alternate uh, every year, either the wise or this. Thank you for being here. You've encouraged us to do the dynamics, and that we've never done the dynamics in Indulci U below before. We've never even bothered to look at them, but it does make a big difference, and we will do from now on. Thank you for being here. <laughs> and uh, at five o'clock uh, on Christmas Eve Evensong in King's College, Cambridge, they also sang this hymn, The Manger Throne, which has practically gone out uh, of use these days. 
and A Virgin Unspotted, which has survived in a different version, A Virgin Most Pure. Now, the 1918 Festival of Nine Lessons and Carols at King's Cambridge grew out of the Christmas Eve Eden Song and the events of the First World War. It was the brainchild of Eric Milner White, Dean of King's. Eric Milner White had read history as an undergraduate at King's and was appointed chaplain in 1912. At the end of the First World War, Milner White returned to Cambridge, decorated with a DSO in recognition of his wartime service as a senior chaplain and combatant officer. Milner White kept the format of the Truro service, but the preposition within the title was changed to a conjunction. Nine lessons with carols became nine lessons and carols. Sit down. It was, as we realize from everything we've been celebrating or remembering this year, a devastating time, clearly. Um, King's College Cambridge, and this was not unusual uh, in terms of all of Europe, lost 199 former choristers, students, and staff in World War I. So a festival of nine lessons and carols was, to a great extent, a commemoration of those lives lost and a wish for a better future. And this is what Eric Milner White was trying to create with his festival of nine lessons and carols. And so the service began. With this invitatory carol. <laughs> Not until 1919 do you get the service beginning with Once in Royal. <coughs> this is uh, a reworking of an old carol by the Reverend George Ratcliffe Woodward. He was an enthusiastic bell ringer, as you can probably tell from <laughs> the first line. Um, you'll doubtless also know Ding Dong Merrily on High. That was his as well. He couldn't, he couldn't help himself. It was, <laughs> it was his hobby, ringing bells. So, this is how the King's service actually began, not as it does today. We discussed this. We don't know how you sing brackets except by making them a bit quieter. I think that's probably how you do it. So this was the carol that was chosen to appear at the very start of the nine lesson service in Kings uh, according to the Truro format. So it begins with what you just heard and then, and only then, it moves on to Once in Royal. Um, here's the first edition of uh, Mrs. Mrs. Alexander's words, which, as you doubtless know, were uh, an elaboration of the Apostles' Creed so that children would be able to understand. Um, so the phrase, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, became the Christmas hymn once in Royal David City. In the same way, you can see here the, the phrase, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, became the Good Friday hymn, there is a green hill far away. That was Mrs. Alexander's uh, thesis. She was trying to make it understandable. The Apostles' Creed, uh, which is difficult enough for adults, uh, is trying to make it comprehensible to children. 
This you'll recognize far more readily. Uh, so here's our favorite once in Royal. Uh, lifted from the 1961 publication, Carol's for Choirs. Note, I've used my copy, which is Carol's for Choirs, not Carol's for Choirs 1. None of your Johnny-come-lately copies here, so this is the original. <laughs> when there was just one of them, as there was, as you know, until 1970. Important year, 1961, Carol's for Choirs, my birth, those kind of things. <laughs> um, and here it is in Arthur Mann's harmonization. Daddy Mann, so he's the man that, has been, uh, was conducting King's, the choir of King's College, Cambridge, in, eight, um, in uh, 1918, when the festival of Nine Lessons and Carols first happened there. He very cleverly took Gauntlet's own harmonization of the opening, that wonderful thing of coming down from earth to heaven, but then he, uh, he alternates that with various harmonies from the hymn's ancient and modern version. Um, it's, it's, it's a very clever way of doing it, and this is what M.R. James was reporting, that moment when you hear the start of the second verse that, that he reckoned was the very texture uh, of Christmas. So now let's hear once in Royal, um, as you would hear it now, as you would have heard it from 1919, with all the trebles, in this case sopranos, but all the trebles singing verse 1, and then verse 2 in Daddy Man's wonderful Kingsian harmonisation. So the 1918 carol service was designed to stand as a memorial to those who had forfeited their lives in bloody conflict and as thanksgiving for those who had survived. The dean, Eric Milner White, who devised the service, himself had several lucky escapes. And it also stood as a beacon of optimism for a better future. Um, as I say, in 1918, the choir of King's College Cambridge was run by Daddy Mann. He'd been running the choir at King's since 1876. That's four years even before the first groundbreaking nine lessons with carols at Truro Cathedral. Daddy Mann was a Victorian-born choirmaster, and he possessed all of the stereotypical mannerisms and habits that that, uh, that implies. But bear in mind that this carol service was introduced at King's when A.H. Mann was in his fifth, dec fifth decade of service there, and it's a testament to Mann's perennially youthful outlook that at the age of 68, he was able to embrace new ideas and to adopt new working practices. He was a truly remarkable man. Um, the order of service tells us what we should think, uh, uh, in particular about how it puts um, Cambridge City as well as uh, um, the, uh, the university. It lumps them together. Um, and in particular, I think the, the masterstroke of this uh, 1918 service was the bidding prayer by Dean Milner White, which is remarkable, um, because that really tells you what it's all about. What it does is it sets you up 
with a great piece of liturgy. It's, it's, it's under 300 words long. It's kind of the same size as the Gettysburg Address. The point is, if you're really writing good prose, you don't need to write very much of it. And that's what this bidding prayer is all about. Uh, it puts everything in context. It talks about the city, about the university. It talks about Bethlehem. It talks about uh, the mother of Christ. Uh, references the fact that the chapel at King's is, is, is dedicated to Mary. All this is done. Uh, prays for the poor, the helpless, the hungry and cold, the oppressed, sick and grieving. All of them are dutifully remembered, um, crucially in not very many words. And by doing this, he also is saying, and now you are just going to listen to words and music. Without my intervention, this is how it's going to work. It's a beautifully designed prayer. But the crucial thing is here right at the end. And that's what people were there for. The people, all those who rejoice with us, but upon another shore and in a greater light. Everybody that was in King's Chapel that day had lost somebody close to them. Some of them, many, many, many. So it becomes clear, this was a memorial service as much as anything else. Of course it was a celebration. It was a celebration of Christmas and looking forward, but it was primarily a memorial service. As I say, remember that 199 choristers, students and staff from King's lost their lives. It was a relatively small college at the time. In uh, praising the ecclesiastical beauty of this service, I think we still do well to remember how these carols took on the refined air that they did in 1918 and to an extent that they still do now. The carols were taken off the streets of Cornwall, they were put into the choir stalls at Truro, and then they travel to the choir stalls of kings. And here's how one of them, for instance, did it. We'll start with a shanty. It then moves to an outdoor carol. It then moves to another form of outdoor carol. And finally, Charles Wood in Cambridge in the early 20th century gets his hands on it and puts it absolutely in church. So here's the, um, here's the sea shanty uh, oh, we sailed to Virginia. turn that into a Christmas carol. Just use the same tune and change the words. Gilbert, the Cornwall MP, uh, went around collecting uh, uh, carol tunes in the early 1820s. He found it in this state. Uh, um, Gilbert, by his own uh, admission, knew very little about harmony. He brilliantly just wrote down what he'd heard or what his, uh, his musical friend heard. So that was a proper transcription. When Charles Wood gets his hands on it and he, as it were, Cambridgeizes it, um, he's just down the road at Keyes uh, College when this is happening, he turns it into something that's absolutely fit for the choir stalls.
proof if proof were needed that there's no place uh, for any type of purism in the history of the English carol. You can take more or less anything you want, uh, and they will have started somewhere you don't necessarily expect. But that is not an unusual thing from sea shanty to outdoor carol and then into the choir stalls. The point is, uh, and any great composer would have told you that, if it's a good tune, it's a good tune, and you don't want to waste good tunes. And so, in 1918, after the final blessing, was the recessional hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. <coughs> and this is an important one, because Hark the Herald is the only musical item that has never moved from its 1918 position or been replaced. It's the only one. It finished the service in 1918. It finishes the service now. It's never done anything else but finish the service. A lot of them have been around since 1918, but they've moved around. Things like Once in Royals moved around, O Comely Faith. They all moved around apart from Hark the Herald to the wonderful Mendelssohn tune. And we'll do it as it's printed in uh, Ancient and Modern. Do by all means have a look at Bramley and Stainer and uh, Ancient and Modern afterwards. But I've got Ancient and Modern open at the, uh, at the Once in Royal uh, page for your guide. Uh, but now we'll do Hark to finish with. We'll sing Hark the Herald, uh, the final verse, as hymns Ancient and Modern did. In hymns Ancient and Modern, they ended every hymn with an Amen. And that's how we'll end it in, and as I imagined, that it ended in 1918 as well. <laughs> 